Welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Ham Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for HGA, and I'm your, your host today. Um, we have a very grateful student as our sponsor today. Isn't that a nice thing? Uh, we've, we appreciate this person for sponsoring Textiles and Tea. Um, we will take questions as always, the last 15 minutes of the program. Please put them in the Q&A, that way I can see them. Love your comments though in the chat, keep those coming. Um, and we are so excited to have a, um, the grand dame of weaving, if you might say, is Norma Smady. She's joining us today. Norma is a weaver, a teacher, an exhibitor, and a juror. She learned how to weave in Norway and occasionally she returns there to teach. In 1974, she established and continues to run the Saunders Town Weaving School in Rhode Island. She has an MFA in visual design from UMass Dartmouth and has received the HGA Award of Excellence, the News Weaver of Distinction, and the Weavers Guild of Boston Distinguished Achievement Award. Norma has written articles for various weaving journals, has had work featured in several books, and Norma's special interests include Scandinavian weaving, in the works of William Henry Harrison Rose and Bertha Gray Hayes. Andale Weaving was with a fan read, and she's gonna talk some more about that today also. She co-authored Weaving Designs by Bertha Gray Hayes in 2009 and Andale Textiles in 2017. We are so excited to have you here today, Norma. How are you? Thank you so much. I feel very privileged and honored to be here. Oh, it's our honor. We're so excited. So what's, what's your favorite tea? My favorite tea, I have two. One is Earl Grey. Uh-huh. Today it's Lady Grey. Oh, what's on your mug? Um, it's an uh, Edward Gorey drawing. He's one of my favorite artists. Oh, cool. Edward Gorey. So I, something interesting about this, he's always been a favorite artist, writer of mine. He's very quirky. And he wrote a book about uh, someone trying to uh, to write a book, being an author, and it was just very funny. And I read it when I was trying to write Angela Textiles. And after I finished the book and sent it off to the my publisher, my editor, I then sent her a copy of the book. And she called me immediately saying, and said, guess what's my face screen, my screensaver? It's an Edward Gorey. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So that was fun. I'll have to look that up. That sounds good. Well, tell us how you got started in weaving. Well, I started like almost all of the people who you've been interviewing with from my grandmother. Um, that wasn't weaving, that was textiles. That was needlepoint, cross stitch um, as a child. So 80 years ago, I wove, I didn't weave, I cross stitched a towel, which I still have hanging in my kitchen. That was the first inspiration for textiles. Uh -huh. um, not much more beyond that. My mother didn't do anything in the way of textiles. But soon after I was first married, I lived in Norway for four years and I discovered a blanket in this wonderful craft shop that was labeled handwoven. And I had a clue that people actually did any hand weaving. I thought it all came from the mills. So I decided at that point, if somebody there was hand weaving, it must happen in Norway and I would have to learn how. I found a school, I found, found a couple. The first one I found was fabulous for me um the warps were all on the looms all we had to do was throw a shuttle and weave beautiful norwegian projects uh, i came back to the states with a loom that they had warped for me i wove it off and hadn't a clue was what to do next so i was then back in norway well actually i found a mentor here who helped me and then i was back in norway for a year and took weaving full time and it was fabulous that was my beginnings well, you, you talked about that you learned in Scandinavia. It sounds like you were in, in Norway and Finland, right? Yes. So how do you think learning in those countries, because their approach is really different from what I understand. Yes. The United States. How do you think learning in those countries had impacted on you as an artist and the way you weave and the way you approach weaving? I think it's it formed the way I'm a weaver. Um, I was there long enough, so it definitely was instilled in me. Um, and so almost all of the training was in Norway. I had just two weeks in Finland with Sister Bianca, 
Hogleish, who is still weaving, teaching weaving in Terrytown, New York, as we speak. Um, but in Norway, I had this fabulous weaving teacher, Ulla Hansen, to whom I will forever be grateful. The weaving school was charming. It was an old, old-fashioned building full of old all kinds of old looms, mostly counterbalance and countermarch, but all kinds. So we learned not to be afraid of looms. We learned that looms are our friends. We just have to learn how to work with them. <laughs> Wonderful Scandinavian, so a lot of Swedish and Finnish as well as Norwegian yarns, books, um, projects to weave from. And I learned um, to look at these books, particularly Finnish that I couldn't read, and recognize the drafts, the threading, the tie up, the treadling, that may have been in the reverse order from ours. Shaft one is on the back, and for us, shaft one is in the front. But as soon as you get that, you can understand what, what it's about. It's visual. And so I, I really learned how to search out patterns, drafts, and, and I will always be thankful for that. Um, I think this is where I'm not afraid of trying a draft, and if it doesn't work, try it another way or go on to something else, but it's not something to be scared of. Well, did you know the language? I knew Norwegian, I lived there a lot. I've lived there for about six years. So I learned in Norwegian. And actually when I came back and started a weaving school here, I had trouble <laughs> translating back into American or English. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I have a hard time understanding English weaving instructions. <laughs> I can't imagine what it must be like to try to do it in two different languages. They were so helpful to me. Everyone there was incredibly helpful, friendly, um, went out of their way to make sure that this American would get it before they sent me back to the States so that when I came back here, they really wanted me to be able to teach properly, adequately. They were good. Well, you are well known for the fan read. Um, and how did you get introduced to that? And what was the appeal? And we have a, a nice image of the read right here. And if you could yes. talk a little bit about what this is for those who don't understand what this is. So in 2010, Convergence, I believe was in Denver. And I was just, I had signed up for a lot of the classes. One of the classes I wasn't really sure I wanted, but there had been a wonderful cover on handwoven of two towels, one woven with a fan read and one without. And some of my weavers had said, oh, I want to do that. And I knew I really didn't because it was going to be too time consuming. Mm -hmm. But I thought I should take the class anyway to find out more about it. It was with Sarah Von Treskow, and she was phenomenal. Her work was gorgeous. She had a fan read there. I was sold. After that lecture, within 30 minutes in the vendor's hall, and I bought myself a read. <laughs> it was, it's a beautiful, beautiful tool. And you can see from that photograph, that's a good photo. It's really a lovely tool. It glistens. Um, and what you make is beautiful. And I think later on, there'll be a picture of the cover of the book. Mm -hmm. And if so, that shows what it looks like with the weaving on the loom. Um, here at the school, when, when I'm doing something I'm really excited about, I encourage all the weavers to come look at what's on my loom. And here for days, I was just saying, come look at my loom. It's so beautiful. The weaving looks absolutely incredible. And it's the way the warp undulates through the reed and stays undulated. It's beautiful cloth, it's different. However, how do we ever see a warp that's not straight? <laughs> it's magical. So I you want me to talk that. about I, the- I wanna see that, yeah. You want me to talk about the reed? Yeah, that'd be great, yeah. So the reed is composed of wires. Um, the dent is the space in between. The wires are what, and are in our ordinary reeds, the wires are what divide the spaces. And instead of going vertically up and down, they are fan-shaped. Mm -hmm. So looking at halfway up the reed, dead center, this reed is a 12.5 dent reed. It's a metric system, but it's essentially a 12 dent reed. Um, and the dents are even all the way across. But if you look at one fan, the dents become very close at the top and very wide at the bottom. So the set is very different. When you use the reed, you raise or lower it on the, on the loom. So as you raise it up, 
all the the spaces at the bottom of a wide fan become widely spaced and where it's close they become closely spaced and and that forces the warp in that direction then when you lower the reed and it's very gradually lowering it half a centimeter or a centimeter at a time as you lower it the warp threads shift to what was widely spaced to becoming very narrowly spaced and vice versa it's slow uh, when I first got the read, I read the directions carefully. I have a Glomacher loom, so I have um, the beater is hung from the top, and I knew I could put the read in the beater, but the directions came with take the beater off the loom, suspend the read from the top of the loom in Texolve, and every time you want to advance the read up or down, you move the Texolve up with a peg, move it up or down, and the problem that I had was you have to beat, they now have a free swinging reed. You have to beat absolutely straight to the fell of the cloth to get it to weave properly. And I started that, I was having troubles with it. It was slow going. And I looked at my beater, which was sitting be so standing beside the loom and realized I could put this reed into my beater. I didn't need to have it free swinging. The funny thing that happened then was I, I had the, the reed hanging from my loom. I had the beater nearby, and this is a wide 54 inch loom. I picked up the beater with the uprights and I moved it over very carefully watching what I was doing very carefully. I had to bend it at an angle to get it back, the uprights behind me to get the bottom part in properly. I have shelves behind me that are full of yarns and I took off every cone of yarn on one shelf as I moved it. And I could hear the yarns going clump, clump, clump to the floor. <laughs> and I couldn't even look and see it, but I got the beater in place. And once I got the beater in place, then I didn't have to worry about the, the beater swinging back and forth, the reed swinging back and forth. It all came parallel to the fell of the cloth. And that was what I needed. That was beautiful. And, and so from then on, it's still a slow process. I have to, because it's a wide loom, I have to get up from my loom and go to the right upper peg and raise it or lower it, and then go to the left side and raise or lower that. And so this is maybe every six shots, every eight shots, I do that. It's good exercise. I'm, I'm glad to do it. It gets me off my loom bench and moving. And so, and I'm so happy weaving without reed. I don't mind this slow process at all. Well, that's amazing. I, I hope we'll see it at Convergence too this year. Hope so. to see them. Well, you, you liked it so much you wrote a book. Why is that? Why did you write a book about it? Well, um, with Sarah's blessing, I did, uh -huh. Sarah Von Tresco. There is very little out there in the literature. In fact, there's almost nothing in the literature. Yeah. I researched as much as I could find. Um, I found a few weavers who were working with the reed, but not very many. Um, and as I began to research more, I realized this is something that should be in the literature. I continued to weave um, using this read. But what really got me going on this particular book was Convergence in 2014 was in Providence. Mm. And I was standing in the Schiffer book booth um, talking with some of the Schiffer people and I had already written the Bertha Gray Hayes book a few years before, which turned out to be a successful book. And the uh, Schiffer representative there said, when will you write your next book? And a weaver who was standing next to me, someone I know, said, ask her to write a book on Andale. So this person said, send us a proposal. I hadn't thought about it before, but I sent in a proposal, they accepted it. I had a great editor, wonderful editor, and um and i had tremendous help from gretchen white and i i know i just wove more and more and more and i think my goal for weaving the book was to see how many different weave structures i could weave or how they weave structures would be affected by the undulation of the warp mm -hmm. um structure is important to me and most of the work that i found and still find is plain weave but I thought there could be more than plain weave. And so I tried, um, I don't know, 10 different structures in maybe 20 different weavings. It's something like that. It's, I've tried a lot of different structures 
and some don't work very well. Some I have to pursue again and again till I get it to work out right. Yeah. Well, I I think it's a gift to weavers that you did that book. Well, you know, uh, you use a lot of color and pattern. And I have to ask, I always seem to ask people this, which for you is more important? Or maybe I should ask which comes first. And um, we have um, a couple of images coming up. So I suppose I'm a structure person. I really love weave structure, but it would be terrible to, to not have color in my life. I love, I love color. Um, I've struggled with it all the time because some things work and some don't. When you think they will, maybe they don't. But I do like color. Um, so I really like working with the combination. I can't do one without the other very well. But um, yeah, I, but, I, but to answer your question, basically, I'm a structure person. We're having a little technical difficulty here. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> what, do, do you find that you choose one over the other first? Do you, you pick up yarn and go, I love this color. Oh, I know a pattern that'll go with it. Or do you find, oh, I want to do double weave. Oh, I know the colors that'll go with that. Does it ever work that simple? Um, and so first there'll be an image in my mind of what I want to weave. Uh -huh. And with the one on the left, I wanted a shawl that was graceful. Um, I wove with the undulation, with an undulate reed, it's subtle. So it's only on the bottom left half or the bottom right side where it's undulated. This is a special fan reed that I have. I had a couple of reeds made just for me uh, that I had designed. And this one has undulations on the right side and plain straight dents on the left side. So the left side of, of the weaving were blocks of lace weave alternately with plain weave and the right side had undulations in uh, silk and cotton. Um, the interesting thing about this, it's not really white, it's grays and silvers with a lovely navy or dark blue, indigo blue. Mm. Those dark stripes through there, I had been given a ball of yarn, hand dyed, hand spun, and dyed cotton dyed with indigo from Roland Ricketts. This was a huge treasure and I didn't know how I was going to use it just I had just that much. How could I use it and really showcase it? And this it's this nubbly yarn that worked well, even though the dents get so narrow at the bottom. I didn't have any broken threads. It went right through wove beautifully. The piece on the right is Norwegian style. Um, this actually was something that the, it's a design that would have been woven for christenings, um, weddings, probably funeral services, put it on the table and the priest would put the Bible on that square and then it would be hung behind them on the wall afterwards. Um, it's a, it's a, I believe it was a six shaft, like a monk's belt, um, mm -hmm. where the that square is picked up, but the rest is all treadled. All Norwegian colors, a very Norwegian in style and feel. Well, I, I chose those because of you know the color difference, but it, it strikes me that the scope of your weaving style is that there's you know there's some people you look at it and you know exactly who wove that. It just, that's their look. And you have this great scope of, you do everything, you know, those are so different and beautifully done, of course, but it's, it's really unique. I love that. Well, they are different. Um, for one thing, I weave a lot and I have not pursued any one thing. I'm mean, a pursued Angela textiles and Bertha Gray Hayes and Weaver Rose in their way, but I've never pursued just one thing and made that my, you know, the scope of my weaving forever. I am too interested in other things. Part of it is because of inspiration from my weaving students. Mm -hmm. But um, so the something like the piece behind me, one of the I think another one of the pieces you showed early on, Janet's wood. I brought out every cone of yarn that I had, and I've got a big stash of things to make a landscape 
I had decided that I would, it was the first time I tried using the fan reed, weaving it with the undulations in the warp, but turning the whole thing sideways. So it became a landscape mm -hmm. with what became undulations across the landscape. So the hills to the mountains, to the sky. And I just brought out every cone of yarn I could think of and moved them around. The dining room table was occupied for weeks. <laughs> and then I would get rid of what I didn't want and move more around. And then I, at that point, then I settle on what yarns are the right fibers. What's going mm -hmm. to fit in the reed, what's going to be appropriate. With wall hangings, you can be more flexible in variation in fibers, so long as it works, but um, have more, more room to play with a different quality of fibers. Um, and narrowed it down to the colors I wanted, lined them all up, wound the warps and got it on the loom and that became a landscape. And I've done that a couple of times since. Well, speaking of teaching, you are such an accomplished teacher and you're just well known and well loved as seen by you have your sponsor here for textiles and tea. But um, if you listed all of the things that's really important to teach, what would be like the first three things that you think are the most important things to teach a new student or to make sure they know or pass on to them? Um, what a loom can do with the weaver, what a weaver can do with the yarns, understanding the threading, understanding the th concept of threading and then treadling and how they work together. So I have a number of students that I will have. Um, I work on little simple Harrisville looms with direct tie up mm. and direct tie up. They get to know what happens when they hit treadle one shaft one goes up. If you have a standard tie up and it's one and two, then two and three, you don't really get it as a student, as a beginner, but I want them to, to understand what's happening. A table loom works well here, although people generally don't like them. So it's understanding the concepts of what the loom is doing with the yarns. Uh, how to choose the right quality yarns for the right project. Don't come in with rug wools if you're gonna do a soft scarf. And I've had, you know, that sort of thing happen that you, you have to figure out what you can't do. But on the other hand, I try to be open to student suggestions for what if, and I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be horrible. You could never do that. And so many times I keep my mouth shut, fortunately, and it turns out to be really successful. Things I would never have thought of. You know, I like that. Or if it's not going to be too disastrous have them work on it and realize why it doesn't work mm. that's important too oh that's great that's wonderful um the song to finish to finish that kathy is to have them finish the project and take it off the loom and be proud of what they've done they have woven cloth and even if it's the very first kitchen towel that's wonderful yeah it Go is. Ahead. It is. Absolutely. Well, the Saunders Town Weaving School, um, as we've got some images of it, and it's just, it's just beautiful inside. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Um, it's kind of like weaver's paradise. You know, you could just go in there and stay absorbed in all the weaving. So you and your husband put in a great deal of time, money, effort to make this possible. So first of all, what was your inspiration that you knew that you wanted to build a weaving school? And did you know at the time how successful it would be? I had no idea that it would be successful, but I knew when I came back from Norway, I had been given so much kind information, so much information from people who really cared about passing it on to Americans and they thought Americans couldn't weave. They, there was not enough communication there, I guess. But I came back knowing I wanted to teach Mm -hmm. And Andrew helped me get the school started. He had much more belief in where it was going. He was a huge support. Um, and it's just grown over, you know, it's 48 years now that the school's been going nonstop. And so it's grown steadily. Um, but the, so the inspiration really came from the Norwegian school. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole variety of looms, the, the fact that every student had a different project. Um, there was no, oh. in that school, as with mine, there was no lecture time, no sit down, and this is the way we all do something. 
every student have a different project going and we would all gather around a loom and find out what was so wonderful about it and we learned we all learned to appreciate the different projects going on and then want to try them <laughs> um, so it was this that i don't give lectures we do get together once in a while to discuss a particular topic but each student has a different project and what you find going through the whole school is once there'll be a crook brog rug and next year there'll be two or three and the next year there'll be those purples that you saw on that first rug and it goes to a scarf and so things just mushroom across the school it's wonderful well, it's the students that's interesting that you you everybody does their own thing i mean yeah. you, you could sit and discuss that topic for hours right oh i could which is where which is the right way to do that so that's interesting that you do it that way i'm gonna have to corner you sometime i want to hear more about that <laughs> Now you're very much into historic weavers. I understand that um, in your curriculum, you usually include uh, Weaver Rose and Bertha Gray Hayes, and you actually co-wrote a book on Bertha Gray Hayes. So what do you think the passion is for you about these historic weavers, especially Hayes? Well, yeah, you know, I'm not sure it's especially Hayes any more than Weaver Rose, and he was the one who started it. So when I learned to weave in Norway, I learned Norwegian patterns and designs. I did go to the USIS Information Services Library and I found a weaving book by Atwater, mm -hmm. Shuttlecraft book. And there was a paragraph in there about this man from Rhode Island, Weaver Rose, and a paragraph about what he had done and photograph. Well, I knew when I returned to the States, I was going to be living six miles from where he had been. Oh. So I was aware of him as somebody who had lived here famous, but centuries ago, a century ago. Um, soon after I came back and I started the school, someone in, in Saunderstown, whom I didn't know very well, was aware that I was looking for looms and he approached me and said, I have a loom in my barn that I'd sell you. It was his wife's. She had long since died. And he said, you can take the loom and whatever goes with it that's weaving related. So Andrew and I brought the loom to the school. I took this packet. So there was a large packet of wooden board we covered in oil cloth and it mm -hmm. said rose patterns and i was naive about this i thought rose path how can it be that much rose path but i took it home opened it up and it still gives me goosebumps when i think about it it was and i recognized it was weaver rose's original handwritten drafts wow so really? i have about 250 of his handwritten patterns drafts just the threadings on all kinds of paper. Um, they are absolutely incredible. And, you know, if you get given this gift, what can you do? I had no choice. I absolutely had no choice but to start working on it. Most of it's overshot. I was never going to like overshot, but <laughs> I had no choice because that's what he did. Uh, so I've woven a lot of overshot. I've woven lots of variations of overshot and have continued to work with him with his work, um, research him. And then with Bertha Gray Hayes, a similar thing happened. She had, as an adult, she had lived in Providence and when she died, no successors, survivors after her. So someone mm -hmm. from uh, Massachusetts acquired her loom and her weaving stuff, um, Claire Krastowski, who then moved to Florida, retired there and at some point wrote back to a friend in Massachusetts and said, I've got Bertha Gray Hayes's looms, I've, but you should really keep her shoebox full of patterns and sent literally a shoebox full of patterns. And you can see um, on the cover of the book, they are samples of her weaving. And on the, the back of the backdrop, the black and white is um, drawdowns, computer generated drawdowns of her mm -hmm. patterns. Mm -hmm. We had a shoebox of 72 adorable little cards with the front had her logo and the name of, and number of the pattern. The inside on the left had her threading and the right side had a three by four inch square of her hand woven cloth for that pattern. And so these were 72 Bertha Gray Hayes wove weavings. What could we not do but write a book? Mm -hmm. I mean, it has to get out there. It can't be stuck in a library somewhere. 
that has to be out in the public. And so um, Gretchen White did all of the computer drawdowns. Jody Brown was really my editor and Katie Schelling did the historical research. I wrote the book and we found first the 72 patterns. And then as we researched more, we found another must have been 18 because I think there were 90 or 92 patterns in the book. And towards the end, Jody kept saying, that's it. Don't find any more. We've got to get the book to the publisher who was, you know, pushing pressure on us. And at the end, I found two more. The last pattern I found, Bertha had called Afterthought. And Jody said, okay, Afterthought, that's the last pattern going in this book. <laughs> and so we researched that very thoroughly. Actually, the book has just been reprinted. It's been very successful because it's got these sweet little patterns. They're all miniature overshots. Um, they're very pretty. People love them. And um, so the book has been a, a good seller as far as I can tell. Schiffer has just had it reprinted. And there's virtually no change in the in the book. The, you know, we have not found anything much more, a few errata, except that, and everybody who's listening should know this if you've got the book, Bertha Gray Hayes has now been identified as second from the left in the second hand row in that the big photograph of from the conference so we know who she was we didn't find out until after the book was published wow that's so wonderful that you in a way saved her and her work and that's so wonderful that you've done that yeah and you saved know? him and his work too yeah both yeah. of them yeah that's, well, it's amazing to do one book. You've already done two. Yeah. And I think I know the answer to this question, but if you could do any book, any topic, any person, what would it be? Well, I have in mind two books. One of them will be Weaver Rose. And so it won't be much in the way of history. I, I think a lot of the good history is out there. Mm -hmm. Alda Kay wrote a, an excellent article in Shuttle, Spindle and Die Pot decades ago. And that's from the research I've done, that's as authentic as anything. A lot of it has been idealized and fantasized, but hers is, real, I think, really solid. Um, so I, what I would do is identify a specific number of, probably summer and winter, but a specific number of threadings and weave them and write about something more specific about Weaver Bros. I can't say more about that because I have to write a proposal first and to work with Schiffer. And I will work with Schiffer. They've been great publishers. Um, the second book, Peter Schiffer actually talked to me a number of years ago about writing it. What I think he wanted was a book of patterns that would come from the weaving school here. And I don't want to write a recipe book. That's not what I'm about. So I thought about it for a while. And I think what I would do there is because three shaft weaving is unusual and amazingly simple, um, but something I've done a lot of. I would have this book be laid out with a large section of three shaft weaves and then four, five, six, seven, and eight shaft weaves, give a, give a few recipes, if you will, for each of these chapters, but mostly weaving theory, how you can get a, a five shaft weave, why do a five shaft weave, and what's different from, from a four shaft. So that's a goal too. You heard it here first, folks. Once again, <laughs> textiles and tea is front line with the knowledge that we got more books coming. And that's wonderful. I love those topics. Well, it'll be a long time yet, but they're and coming. You can do it this summer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you gotta come back on the show and talk about those books. Okay. Especially the Weaver Rose. I would love to learn more about Weaver yeah. Rose. Well, so to go back to the Weaver Rose, I think we're not going to show a photograph because I don't have a good one to, for you to show. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Well, it's not your fault. I don't have one. But um, last fall, a Weaver Rose loom built by either him or his grandparents, it's old, old mm -hmm. loom, um, was available probably on its way to the dump if I hadn't mm -hmm. said I'd be willing to take it. And I have no space here. but. I've got some great weavers who managed to shove the looms aside and we fit it in. And I have two weavers, Liz Hill, who's my weaving assistant, and Jeff Mee, who is a woodworker, weaver, um, and respects the history of Weaver Rose. 
and the three of us are working on the loom. We've got it set up. It's an amazing loom. It's got this incredible loom bench that's cantered. It's, it's got five legs that fasten into a crossbar in the front of the loom, but it's cantilevered out behind the loom. Huh. It does not look safe. <laughs> uh, we will get it repaired so that it's the way it was. But then Jeff is going to construct a stand behind it. So when we sit on it, we won't fall off. Um, but he will keep the loom looking as original as possible. We are, you know, we've got old string heddles that I have washed there. And I have no choice but to use string heddles because I don't have the metal rods to put heddles on, either Texolve or steel heddles. So it's going to have to be string. Unfortunately, I've got a lot. They're going to have to be put on probably one at a time. But it will be a, a work of love. Oh, that's great. And you'll see more about that later. Yay. Yay. Well, you are part of a really amazing weaving group called the Cross Country Weavers. Yeah. Um, and if, if I have this correct, one of the projects that y'all did was to do a weaving that was inspired by artwork. And my understanding is that yours, you chose Paul Clay, and we have the work and the uh, weaving that you did. So can you talk some about that whole project? What inspired you? What was your thinking? Well, Paul Clay is one of my most favorite artists and has been for years. He has very weaverly approaches to his work, I think. At least I see it there. If you look at this, it's a block weave, his painting on the left. Um, I looked at that and I could see, I can't, I don't want to reproduce it. I'm not a tapestry weaver, but I wanted to do something that gave that feel. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the, the amount of black that I have in there and the different colors of reds and golds. Um, he, he um, painted on canvas, a very coarse canvas that you can, on some of his paintings, you can see it coming through mm -hmm. where he doesn't cover the canvas completely or he'll leave the canvas sort of fray, frayed at one end. So you really see the canvas, the cloth. So the, I think the cloth mattered to him. He's done a lot of drawings and paintings with lots of parallel lines, um, lots of parallel lines. They look like twill lines, mm. if, uh, exaggerated. So I can see block weaves, I can see twill lines. Um, and the other thing that I've learned about more recently is that he taught in the Bauhaus. Annie Albers was a weaver, weaving student and then a teacher in the Bauhaus. And a loom that I have here was used in the Bauhaus. Maybe she, maybe Annie Albers sat on the loom bench and taught weavers, you know, a new technique. But Paul Clay, of all the masters there, liked the weavers the best. Hmm. He taught them mathematical principles. He taught them uh, rhythm and proportion and multiplication and division, but he worked with the weavers. So I can see why from his work, he identified with them. And, you know, I believe that he leaned on my loom bench and that's why there's great spirit in it. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, would you talk a little bit? I know everybody's going to ask. Would you talk a little bit about cross country weavers? Well, cross country weavers is a, it's a wonderful group of 30 weavers who started 60 some years ago at the New England Weaver Seminar. There was someone who said we should get together and and share samples and it mushroomed. And so the 30 weavers, occasionally one drops off and another one, it gets added on. Uh, we share six inch samples. They must be six inches. We have a given topic every year, alternately a structure topic and a design topic. Mm. So weaving based on artwork would have been a design year. And we share the 60 samples, the 30 samples with all of us with a very specific draft sheet. Um, you know, they're printed just for, they're like, like other good draft sheets, but they're printed for cross country weavers. Um, we must mail them in March, not the day before and not a day after. <laughs> it's very specific and this goes back to the very beginnings the directions they set up good weavers good sharing um exhibits once in a while we meet at news or i'm sure we've met more than once at convergence 
we'll set aside time and everybody who's there who's cross country will get together. Um, we also make two extra samples that get put in a notebook that circulates so any guild or group that wants to rent the books can get in touch with Margie Thompson and yeah, she will she's... put your name on the list and it gets your a book gets sent out. And then uh, after I think probably two years of the book circulating. They go to Thousand Islands Art Center History Museum, History of Weaving Museum. Oh, wow. So they're all stored there. That's wonderful. Yeah. So was this the one that, so you said March, so you must have just submitted one, right? I did. I've sent is this, all this my one? Samples. Hmm? No, this, was this was this years ago. Oh, okay. Uh, a few years ago. No, this year it had to be based on Annie Albers. So I actually wove on the loom that she might have sat on the bench and and you know, I just designed something based on a lot of books, pictures of hers. And so March is wonderful for us because every day another sample comes in the mail. You know, 30 samples in 31 days. So it's just like Christmas, opening another envelope every day and keeping a notebook. Yeah. So I have acquired the ones that um, before I was a member. I think I have all of the cross country notebooks here, and they're wonderful to look at. What I particularly like is my weavers who will go into the library and i've got a good library and they'll pull a cross country weaver notebook off the shelf and just thumb through for inspiration and they know if it's a 16 shaft weave they can't do it but at least probably not here but they can um they can get color from it mm -hmm. design mm -hmm. or they know enough to look through and find something that's probably four to eight shaft i do have a 16 shaft uh, Compu Dobby here, or J Made Loom, but um, J Comp. But other than that, Compu Dobby, the work is all eight shafts or fewer. But so the weavers just get great inspiration from these books. Oh, that's a wealth of knowledge. That's amazing. So, what's next for you besides the book? Well, coming up right now, um, I'm doing a talk on croak rug. So the talk last Tuesday was really interesting on the croak rug rugs. I'm talking on croak rug rugs for the Cranberry Country weavers next month. Um, I'm giving a talk on weaver rows and helping to curate an exhibit at the Gilbert Stewart Museum nearby oh. on weaver rows. That will be in May. I think it probably runs the end of April to early June. Um, I'm doing an Ollie talk, Ollie Osher Lifelong Learning. It's a, an organization that is housed in a lot of universities mm. uh, for seniors who want to take really interesting classes. They offer all kinds. And uh, I taught there once last year on Weaver Rose and Birth of Grey Hayes as being Rhode Island weavers. There's not much that I can teach them that they would be interested in. But we are doing a guided tour this year. They're coming in in May. They're coming to the weaving school and have a guided tour through. So that will be fun. Um, and then in oh, the so the most important part, the Weavers Guild of Boston, and this is uh, has in the advertisements or announcements in the most recent S S and D. Mm -hmm. They are celebrating their hundredth anniversary. And with that, the Fuller Craft Museum, which is a really fabulous craft museum in Brockton, Mass, is having an exhibit there, a juried exhibit, uh, goes from, I think it's May 14th through October. And I have two pieces juried in there, so I'm very excited about that. Um, and they also are having other exhibits at the Charles River Museum. I'll have a few pieces there. And then in the fall, um, Thousand Islands Art Center, the History Weaving Conference is going to be virtual again this year. And so I'm doing a Zoom from the school and it will be notable looms from the school. And this will be fun, I think. It's, yeah. I'm just looking forward to all the various in, really interesting looms that I have here. And then what will be fun will be a humorous retrospective of clothing that I have woven. The Weaver's Guild of Rhode Island is celebrating our 75th and we're gonna have a fashion show. We'll have to get somebody else to model <laughs> because <laughs> some of these I wove 50 years ago. <laughs> but, so that'll be fun. 
so you know all of that's coming up and then long term i'm really hoping for a retrospective i've talked to a couple of weavers and maybe we'll have a retrospective exhibit somewhere norma you wear me out <laughs> you are one busy woman <laughs> weaving is a wonderful environment occupation hobby whatever you want whatever part of it you're in it's just all encompassing and i've got some wonderful people here that that work with me wonderful students well speaking of students we've been seeing in chat all kinds of folks saying hi but let's look at some of the questions that we've got is that okay? okay all right um let's start with jane kaplan I have your book, it's beautiful. Can you put the reed in a jack type loom? I'm assuming she's talking about that fan reed, right? Yes. And so, yes, but, um, so if you go to the book, you can see what Pat Foster did. She really reconstructed the her table loom. Um, you can see what, oh boy, the name escapes me, the woman from Texas the fan reed weaver um she used two jack looms mm -hmm. and she devised something that you'll hang over the castle and support the loom the reed so absolutely you can you just have to jerry rig your loom a little bit it's possible um i'm not sure i understand this question maybe you will this is from karen leblanc can you talk about the first hand woven blanket that you found does that make sense to you? Hand woven blanket no. that you found. No. Karen, if you could um, come back in and clarify that um, while we're waiting for her. Um, Pam Kirk, kick life, kick fighter, kick lighter. Sorry. Um, for someone wanting to start weaving with a fan weave, what one or two lessons learned would you, would you say is um, based on your experience? um learn to have patience <laughs> it's a slow <laughs> process um so yes i would start out with a very simple weave structure my first project was an eight shaft m's and w's with a 24 thread repeat and i couldn't tell whether i when i was when it was time to raise the shaft the um read up or where i was in my treadling it was much too complex and it was not a hard weave but you don't want that when you're starting out with a fan read so do something relatively simple um if you look through my book you can see that i went overboard with colors in some of them the double weave um i was experimenting with how the colors would look on the two layers in the fan read as well as just the color it would have been fine just by itself perhaps i think i went overboard with color there i would simplify and and the other thing is i have found this Every project I put on the loom, I had this wonderful idea in my mind of what I want it to be. And very seldom does it actually turn out like that, but you know, other things good or bad can come out of it. So the first, uh, it'll be maybe two or three scarves or maybe three wall hangings. Um, I seldom do more than a five yard warp because the warps aren't that massive. Mm -hmm. um, they're not that wide. And I, so I figure out what I want to do and I treadle the first one and it's too busy. So I simplify, I treadle the second one, it's a little more successful. By the third one, I really get it right. But it takes simplifying and simplifying, I think. That's probably my advice. Good advice. Good advice. Um, Nancy Feynman. Hi, Nancy. Uh, would you repeat Bertha Hayes' position in the book group photo? Second from the left in the second row. Okay, second from the left in the second row. All right. Um, what fiber and loom did Hayes use to weave those tiny cloths? <laughs> Good question, Bernadette. She worked with 22 cotton. She worked with a 15 dent reed, two per dent. She worked on those little table looms that are so you know, metallic and klutzy to work with, but they were her favorite. And they huh. came with only the little structos. They came with a 15 dent reed. 
You could get them with other reeds if you special ordered, but they basically came with a 15 dent reed, which meant you were weaving 30 ends to the inch because that's what you did hmm. for dent. So she worked with 22 cotton. Um, she worked mostly with cotton, some wools, some. Um, so this goes back to the early 40s, the late 30s, when you could get that um, space dyed cotton, yellow, green, red, and blue. I mean, really pretty in your face space dyed yarns, which she thought was wonderful. Um, so they were crochet cottons. And I think wools were the tote bags. She worked small. She did a lot of doll clothes, doll furniture. Mm. Not furniture, but the you know the beddings uh, for the doll furniture, for doll houses. Okay, we've come back on the the blanket. They said that at the beginning of your talk, I missed it. I'm sorry. That you found a blanket in Norway, and that's what inspired you to test. Oh oh oh! Them. I didn't buy it. I just saw it. It was in a wonderful craft shop. So these craft shops in oh, Scandinavia, that, okay. okay, have okay. you know pottery and some. Um, metalwork and weaving and other textiles, just all kinds of wonderful crafts. I saw a blanket and it was just a wonderful wool blanket, plaid. I don't remember it. I just what I remember is a label that said hand woven. And that's why I'm where I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, our, our previous guest on Textiles and Team, Marcy Petrini, hi Marcy, said if you think Norma is a busy weaver, you should also know how important Norma is to HGA. As president, she led the organization in a difficult transition with incredible grace and smarts. We should all be grateful to her that HGA is still alive. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marcy. That's wonderful. So actually Marcy is um, in my mind because one of the questions I think that you had said you might ask me was what three things I would, maybe you already did, what three things I would tell my weavers, uh -huh. if I could teach them just three things, what they, would they be? And one would be to, if you're looking at recipes in a magazine or a book, make it your own, put in your own colors, yarn sets, but make it your own, be a little bit creative. Another one would be mistakes happen. Just know that, and if it's not too far back, please take it out because you'll be happy that you have corrected it. Uh, otherwise, if it's far back, it may become a design element, and that's quite all right. We all have design elements in our weavings. And the third was something that my weavers here will laugh at. Weave to the very, very end of your warp. And so often a weaver will finish the three or four kitchen towels and want to cut it off. And I say, no, you can't. You still have six inches to weave. Choose a different color, choose a different treadling, choose something, you know, make a pincushion out of it, uh, gift cards, weave it. And so they just all laugh about this because they have to weave to the bitter end. But that's where the wonderful accidents happen, mm -hmm. uh, always. And my fourth thing, because I want to have a fourth thing in here, is that something I learned from Marcy years ago was remove just from your vocabulary. When you take something off the loom, just don't say it's, oh, it's just a towel. Say it is a towel with pride, have respect and value for your weaving. And I always think about that when any of my weavers say, oh, it's just a uh, something, they get corrected immediately. Oh, I love that. I'm gonna keep that in mind with my weavers. Yeah. That's excellent. That's just excellent. Um, I just wanna remind folks, be watching the chat uh, out of the corner of my eye, we've got some great information, links on the finding um, the article about the weaving um, roses, uh, the weaving rose, um, the books on the weaving rose, and there's lots of information in the chat. So check those out if, if you're watching today. Um, Jackie Craybill wants to know, how can she view the talk um, about the looms at your school? Where did you say you're doing that talk? Well, oh, and people should should focus on this. In October, I think it's October 24th, 5th, 6th, Thousand Islands Art Center in Clayton, New York, is hosting a historic weaving conference, which they do every year. It will be in October this year. It will be virtual. And um, 
and so anybody across the country, across the world can sign up. It's usually a very small conference limited to maybe 50 people. Last year, because we were on Zoom, there were, I don't know, 150 or whatever it was, a lot more with a speaker from Spain. I mean, how lucky oh, are wow. we that we get, have yeah. this? And so I will be doing a talk on the Bauhaus loom, the Weaver Rose looms. I have a loom that Milo Gallinger built for his wife, Osma Gallinger Todd. Um, I have a two-legged loom, which is really pretty amazing. I have a loom built by, well, he's not a movie star, but he did was in the movies in Hollywood. Um, so I've got a variety of different looms and, and there'll be a, I don't know if it's a half hour, 45 minute talk video. So it'll be a slideshow about these looms. And I encourage people to sign up for this. It's a great conference of historic weaving in all different aspects. There you go. Um, also, somebody was asking about how they can rent the Cross Country Weaver sample book. And Sally, I think you posted it in the question and answer. And if you could put it in the chat, that would help, Sally. Um, because um, Margie do you need to contact you or? Margie Thompson. Margie Thompson, okay. Um, I think we're gonna put that in the chat. So there we go. Uh, is it possible to hear your talk on Krogbrog? <laughs> Olivia Hicks wants to know. I have to practice that after the last textiles and tea. Krog, brog. There's different ways of saying it. Depending I know, on but this is fun. Norway. It's like gargling while I talk. Um, so is there a way to listen to your talk on that? Is not, that on Zoom? Not that I know of. No, it's not on Zoom. I okay. have not wanted it to be on Zoom. I gave it to the Rhode Island Guild a couple of weeks ago, and I'm doing Cranberry. But they've been postponed from last year when everything was on Zoom. Because his work on graph paper, they're going to be doing, you know, coloring in their designs. Oh, okay. So it's it's not available on Zoom. Okay. So people just need to take your workshop, right? Yeah. Absolutely. There you go. All right. Well, I can't believe it. We're going to stop. I got carried away. Norma, thank I cannot you. thank you enough for being on the show. Just sharing everything about what you're doing and your thoughts on weaving. Uh, you're a treasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. You're fabulous and with your job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Make this easy. <laughs> uh, I want to thank again our sponsor, a grateful student. Now, what does that tell you about Norma as a teacher and as a person that somebody wants to sponsor her specifically for textiles and tea? So I'm very thankful for both of you for doing that today. It's been wonderful. If you would like to sponsor an episode of Textiles and Tea or your business or your guild, please go to the website at weavespindie.org and you too can be a sponsor of Textiles and Tea. Oh, and I skipped this. I'm so sorry. Norma has a wonderful website on saunderschannelweavingschool.com. Norma, is your schedule or things that are coming up on that website also? Probably not. I haven't updated it in a long time. All right. Well, if you want to know more about Norma and what she's uh, weaving and just learn more about the school, go there and you can learn tons about the Saunders Town Weaving School. And then um, email me. List now. I'm sorry. Email me. There you go. Email her. Um, if you um, we've got some more programming coming up and I'm, I'm mentioning that because if you like the programming that you see, like textiles and tea or um, the spinning and weaving week, the program we did for the guilds, and the next one coming up, which is career and textiles, please support HGA. The funding for those comes from donations. Um, our, our membership dues doesn't really cover all that. So if you want to support more programming with HGA, please donate or join at weavespindie.org. And right here is correct is the Careers and Textile Symposium. There's still time to sign up. There's still places available. And I hope you'll take a look at this because if you or someone you know is interested in expanding your opportunities in fiber, if you think you might wanna have a career in fiber, if you want to go to school, this symposium is for you. The first day we've got several people in the business. They 
uh, will be a wealth of knowledge on how to get into the fiber business and all the different ways you can be in the fiber business. And then on Saturday, we have faculty members from a variety of schools throughout the US, and they're going to talk about if you want to get a degree in fibers. So again, that's this weekend, March 18th and 19th. You can sign up, weavespendie.org. Um, if you've missed an episode today of Textiles and Tea, you want to watch Norma again, uh, please go to the Facebook page and you can watch them there. And again, you don't have to have a an account with Facebook. You can just watch it. Also, we're posting more of those on YouTube. Please sign up and you will get a notice saying when a new episode has been uploaded. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. What a lovely afternoon with Norma. Again, Norma, thank you so much. Um, we're kind of running with the big hitters here for the next couple of weeks. Norma, today, next week, we've got Daryl Lancaster. If you've not seen Daryl before, she's very entertaining. So please join us next week for another episode of Textiles and Tea. And again, y'all, have a happy tea. <laughs>